The fourth is practice. And the fifth is examples of social movements you should be able to talk about out of the top of the So any questions about the broader outline and signposting so far in this session? No? Okay. We'll also talk about things you might be covering. Feel free to jump in anytime. Just raise your hand and then uh, I will pick on you and you can say stuff. It's fine. I'm very carefree. There's no sense of discipline. Pretty much like most social movements. Yeah. Right, so we've got. So, what is a social movement? I think there are more than three things that are actually. The first is a social movement is a conglomeration and assembly of the demos, the people. But the people itself can manifest in different ways. It can manifest in forms of within political in infrastructure and institutions. So, a politician can be part of a social movement, on a contrary to popular belief. Elizabeth Warren in the United States is a part of the movement that protested in the Dakota Pipeline. Or alternatively, Aung San Suu Kyi was part of the social movement previously that resisted the Myanmar's military authorities until she became a dictator herself. Uh -huh. So there's a clear instance here that members of the political establishment and also in the political system can be part of the movement. So when you talk about the scope of the demos and who participates in it, do not restrict the concept of social movements to only people sleeping on the streets, rallying against the government. You know, those are social movements, a part of it. Sure, certainly, but they're not the only definitive component or the instantiation of social movements. You also have social movements and corporations with activists working within corporate structures to change the way, to engineer the way regulations and also company policies work. That's Company policy design works in that sense. So I think it's worth noting that social movements, first of all, does not have a limited scope and should not be conceptualized as restricted to solely one form of presentation. But, here's where it gets interesting. Judith Butler, on oh, my tissue. I'll pretend that didn't happen. Now, Judith Butler's argument here is that there's something more to the essence of social movements than just people protesting and rallying around each other to like, achieve an organized end. Judith Butler thinks that social movements is also about the performance of our precarity. What does this mean? Well, look, the human condition, you know, coming to this particular academy, means you have to walk past the cars on the street, smell the polluted air while it's not polluted here in China, it's only polluted air. Deal with a lot of potential risks and dangers in your everyday life, especially in your political life, that you can't foresee. If you're living in an authoritarian regime that can crack down upon you, your very day, everyday existence becomes a matter of precarity. That you're hanging on a fine rope or a tight rope between safety and prosecution. And what social movements effectively do is they drag this precariousness out into the open. They exemplify and demonstrate to the public that this is a precarious population for sure, but this is also a population that is willing to take its precarity, its vulnerability, and celebrate it in a political step. For example, if you look at the Jasmine Revolution in China, where dissident protesters, despite clear crackdown from the state, harking back to 1989 Tiananmen Square massacre, decided in 2011, 2012, to stand up against the Chinese government in imitation of the Arab Spring happening in the Arab Peninsula then. Why did they do so? It was not for the fact that they think this can topple the regime. It was not for the fact that they think this can cause the CCP to dissipate, because the very act itself of being present and also manifesting no form of vulnerability and precarity in publicly defying authoritarianism is in of itself powerful and symbolically reassuring. So anyway, that's a sideline of the philosophical essence of social movements. But I think the first point outlining what social movements are about is basically the point I just illustrated there. The second question I want to ask you now though is what is the structure of a social movement? Now usually people would say, well the structure is just you have a leader, you have a few sub leaders, and then you have folks on the ground, come by up. But it's a lot more complicated than that because there are various types of media recognised when you talk about the uh, archetypes and the ontology of, of social movements. One of these types is a top down managed approach. You're talking about a movement with a clear rallying leader, a leader that can clearly issue orders that trickles down to the bottom grassroots of the very movement itself. So, an example of that 
might very well be indeed, in this case, the Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement, where he played predominantly, largely a leadership figure role, and also as a spiritual mentor, and after his death and assassination, a, a top-down figure that became the rallying symbol for that movement. So in these cases, the movements are heavily organised and arranged around one particular figure, and are centred around the cult of personality, or either like Malcolm X, or Martin Luther King, or subsequently the younger generations like Al Sharpton, and what like, all of these are singular personalities that guide and live the movements in one direction. So that's one way of looking at one type of movement. The other type, though, is incredibly dispersed. And the case in point is Hong Kong during the 2014 umbrella revolution, where there was no leader, but there was no one who was able to say, I'm commanding and controlling everyone who was occupying central in China and Hong Kong in defiance of the Chinese government in 2014. Why is this important? Because this means that when you divide social movements, you shouldn't be able to, you shouldn't think in your head that you must have this stereotypical understanding of movement as the leader, the sub leader, and the followers. It's not as simple as that. Some movements don't have leaders, some movements create leaders, some movements lose the leaders, some movements leaders die and they want to replace them. So recognize the types and forms of social movements can come in many manifestations. And underpinning this, the corollary is, social movements can also have different degrees of intensity. So, rhetorical, actually not rhetorical, let's make an interactive, interactive question. What's the difference between a revolution, a riot, and a movement? Anyone have any idea? Suggestions? Thoughts? Revolution versus riot versus movement? Anyone? Please say your name to the rest of the class as well, so we can uh, move against you. So. Maybe the degree of the backlash, I mean... A backlash? Oh, I mean, a movement can have small, uh, small, uh, can, uh, can, uh, can provoke small damage, uh, rise the middle of the damage, and a uh, revolution of higher okay, so like intensity. Right? Okay. Okay. Yeah. I think one can come before the other, so a movement can like escalate to a riot, and a riot, if it has some kind of a big impact, then it can go to a revolution and maybe inspire other people creating this huge... So I think what's worth noting there is two core features. The first is the idea of, of three things I want to know actually. The first is, the difference between these three things are quantitative or in degree, but not qualitative. A qualitative difference is when I say, well, voting in elections is different from killing someone to protest the tyranny. It's quite different. One is operating according to law and institutional law, the other one isn't. Whereas in the case of social movements, the lines are substantially more blurred, where it's not a case where our rights are fundamentally the state of social movements. Instead, it is exactly as per what points out just then by. So, what's your name here? Two Two Lovely. That is a continuum. It is a matter of indeed escalation, a matter of graduation, and you can't really distinguish a social movement that clearly from a right or a revolution. That is not to say that when you're debating it, you go like, well, these social movements are bad because they'll lead to rights. No, no, that's not how you debate it. I think it's worth noting the techniques and methods adopted as rioting are open and also often employed by those in social movements, and that those operating within the context of freedom of rights are also be calling for social revolution. There's a fungibility and compatibility in the language and discourse and rhetoric used across these different forms and manifestations of what we call contentious policy. That is the idea of politically contesting or challenging the established institution, and therefore that's the second thing to note. The final thing to note is there's an evolutionary stage. So be very careful with what you understand this argument, because it's not a claim that all social movements lead to riots that lead to revolutions, and you shouldn't run this as an argument in your debate. What I am fundamentally saying here is you should know that there is often an organic evil for militants. If you talk about a very unstable situation, like, say, the Arab Peninsula, or like the persecution of the Kurds in Syria in this particular time frame, then there's a discussion of a social movement and sponsoring social movement. And you can then, under those circumstances, perhaps consider the possible slippery slope that maybe the social movement could evolve into something more than it originally set out to be. But this doesn't apply to everything. So let's take a look at South Africa. Uh, write this down. Zanu, P-F, Z-A-N-U-P-F, and Zaku, P-F, were the two primary parties contesting uh, apartheid, uh, so if, or white supremacists. And both of them arose from social that it came about because of a partisanization, or what we call a partisan formation, or incorporation, 
of existing social movements that existed in South Africa before then. How do you apply this to the debate? So, you know, you know social movements can fall the predecessor for well, not just rights or revolutions, but also for parties, for official political structures. So, another case in point is the Liberal Party in the Philippines, which arose as a social movement to protest the persisting authoritarian rule under the Marcos and the Kinos, of course, the various dynasties of political war, or dictators and autocrats in the Philippines in the 1960s and 70s. So, some parties evolved from protests, uh, uh, still, uh, well, still disobedience, all social movements, other social movements degenerate into alternative forms of political presence. But the upshot here is you should not think of movements as just the movements and self-contained motion. It is interconnected us with all of these other parts of the way we understand political contestation and disputes and conflicts like that. The final part of this introduction of the notion of social movements, though, is what do they do? What do social movements do? Any ideas? Who hasn't spoken yet? Please speak. Or else I'll uh, pick on you to speak and I'll be uh, drinking Red Bull because no one speaks. <laughs> yeah, what do they do? Uh, so basically, they kind of unite people who have the same problem or the same vision. Like, for example, LGBTQ or the yeah. Two movement. So these people are usually oppressed or have some kind of a problem within the society. And all these visions and problems unite them and they search for better rights for especially these groups. They do not search for equality, but for better rights for these cool. So I think the latter part or the last bit of that I might take slight issue with and I think there might be movements that can say I am fighting for equality or that are yeah. happening for the I appreciate what you're saying. I think that is absolutely right. So one of the main purposes of social movements and the variants are going to go through this with it. The first is to observe or problematize the status quo. So it is a critique function. It is a function, or it is a critique of the established, what they call, imagined or existing or entrenched oppression or inequalities within existing hierarchies. That's one purpose for us in social media, to challenge the status quo, to observe that there are particular forms of, say, manifest discrimination, of injustice in a pay gap, or in particular alienation so it's a lower for working class within the economic structure, yeah. I have a question. I mean, okay, what actually gives power to the social movement? I ask this in the context of, let's say, the Gillette advertise, uh, advertise uh, about boys will be boys. Uh, there was a lot of controversy, and I also, and it was also a small movement, a movement called Let Men Be Men, but it never, have the popularity yeah. and the power like me too. Okay. And, um, so it's also worth noting, and this is a second thing I'd like to clarify, that social movements are not necessarily always progressive or pro-minority rights and what that is a misunderstanding of social movements, right? Because look, a lot of very conservative or reactionary or anti-liberal social movements also exist. So it's not the case that it only exists to call it oppression. They also exist to say there is no such thing as oppression, right? So social movements can go both ways, and both pushing for progress and also advancing against progress for particular rights. That is, if you're a liberal, you think one thing is progress and the other thing is regress, I guess. But the upshot here is that when folks ask you to make social movements, you might then want to consider that very good question that you raised just then. Why do we generally believe that progressive social movements are more effective than conservative social movements? Well, the answer is it's not clear why they actually are. It's just that we often live, especially as competitive debaters, in a very liberal circle. We're like, oh, the liberals are great, conservatives are bad, blah, blah, blah. And then you proceed to imagine that, therefore, liberals are always more effective. But if you look at a lot of the conservative campaigning against abortion and campaigning against LGBT rights in America, they're very efficient at doing that. Now, I disagree strongly with it because I'm a liberal, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they don't work. Conservatives are also very good at rallying the troops and getting people out. So that's exactly what I'm saying. My second function of social movements, they're not necessarily there to protest oppression, they are also be there to advance ideology. So, Marx in social movement advances Marxism, even though there's no necessary oppression from capitalism, which I think has saved many people, and most people just don't think so, but anyway, uh, it's a very thing about the right wing. Anyway, cool. So the upshot here is that Marxism, or Marxist social movements say, we want freedom for workers. We want to be into capitalism places. 
Hitchcock and it's sounding like Scottish because we Scots and know that we're Marxists. We want an end to capitalism. I want an end to ambition by the alienation and false consciousness. Blah blah blah. They aren't necessarily protesting oppression. Like, you can't ask them who is the oppressed Marxist. They won't, what well, they might say, I'm oppressed and then go off their hotel and drink champagne there. But anyway, the gist there is they're advancing a world, a worldview, a better or a different world. And even conservatives who say, I fight against abortion, to say, I want to fight for a world where there's no murder of innocent embryos. That's what they're saying. So, so you are not like only there to protest or to contest oppression and injustice, but also to illustrate or paint a particular picture of what you'd like to achieve and to contest that world within the existing political structure. The final purpose of social movements, though, and this is really crucial, let's be a bit more cynical here, guys. If a politician, very authoritarian in this country, hates democracy, blah, 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 suddenly stands up on this and says, I want democracy. I want transparency. I want my opponents to you know, lose their job because of their corruption. Because I believe that people deserve a choice. Well, as yesterday, he's like, yeah, I believe people deserve a choice. Like, I would get imprisoned or fired by me. What does this make you think he's doing? Do you know that Spider-Man meme who shows the other Spider-Man he's corrupted? <laughs> exactly. Good. So, do you know this meme? Yeah. 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 Social movements can also be pawns and tools of politicians and political figures who seek to manipulate popular sentiments to achieve their end goals in our negotiations. Why so cynical, you may ask? Well, I am very cynical because a lot of politicians drive and fund social movements because it makes themselves more powerful. Tea Party movement, for instance, in the United States is funded by a mixture of the Koch brothers and also very conservative Republicans who want to use the Tea Party movement or the social movement to justify the policies they then push through within the Congress. They go like, ah, ah, leave out an Alabama, ah, leave no Texas are good, and any of Texas are bad. Look at all the people out there signing all my these Texas. But that's exactly what they're doing. They're using popular social movements to justify policies they push within legislature. And you see this especially in Southeast Asian countries where both parties in Thailand, for instance, the yellow shirts and the red shirts fund their respective social movements and they fight it out against each other. One's like, I like farmers, the other one's like, I like civilization. In practice, they're both funded by different parties that care for their own self-interest as opposed to like ideology or like partisan and non-partisan libertarians. So note here that social movements do not only refer to grassroots, civilian-led, innocent, or you know, incredibly super impetuous ways of fighting for justice. It's also a part of the grander political rhetoric that politicians often use to preserve, maintain, and acquire power. So that's part one of this lecture guide. Any questions so far? The more questions there are, the happier debates and conflicts that emerge in social movement debates. And then the first one is the idea of purity versus popularity. The second one is extremism versus centrism. The third one is radicalism versus moderatism. And finally, money. These are all the common issues that you see crop up about social movements in debate land. Now, before I start, debate land refers to not a geographical location, um, nor to a metaphorical location, but I call it a discursive location. It is a location that is situated within the big other, end of your reads, is it? No? Okay, there's the big other of debate, and that is debate land. That made no sense. Anyway, like sovereign military order of Malta? Huh? Like sovereign military order of Malta? Uh, I only know the sovereign military order of Melda. There's a beta. Never mind. Okay, well, let's continue. Great. So, the gist here is let's start with purity versus popularity. So, in some debates about social movements, you might be asked to defend a trade off. The trade off is should this particular movement dilute its message to appeal to more people? Or should it actually stick to its message? What is emotion like? Well, this house believes that feminists should accept, like many emotions, this house believes that feminist and conservative societies should cease all criticisms of religious norms. 
So maybe in conservative religious societies, you can't call out body killings, you can't call out forced wearing of the burqa, you can't call out oppressive religious customs, you only focus your energy on secular or non-religious forms of misogyny. Now, why do I actually have this motion? Well, one way of looking at it is that there's a trade-off between popularity and purity. On one hand, it's to say, hey, well, clearly, you know, in these societies, if you go against religion, you die. Literally, metaphorically, physically, psychologically, and socially. That's a lot of ways to die, dumb ways to die. <laughs> but, on the other hand, if you give up on this particular cause, what is the point of the feminist movement, you may ask? What is the point of the movement that doesn't fight for the most important rights of women and access in reproduction, bodily integrity, freedom of work, and fundamentally affects 90 percent of all women in that particular country, speaker? That's, that's a clash. That is the issue of the debate. So one side is like, ah, popularity, get them in, get the religious leaders on the side, don't piss them off. The other side is like, what's the point of not pissing them off? And that is one way of looking at the common clashes that to social movement. Now, I'm not going to give you the argument here, I'm going to teach you a quick shot as to how you resolve this deadlock. how you break this deadlock. So let's start with this side that stands for purity. Some questions for you to ask the other side is, firstly, why do you need so much buy-in if you're not even campaigning for anything of value, right? Like, imagine a world where you have a politician that says something that's so inoffensive that your conservative friend and your really liberal mother and your super reactionary neo-Nazi like father all go like, yeah, I like this candidate. And this candidate comes into office because it, they all vote him in. And he just sits there. It does nothing. What's the point of letting him? Right? So the first question is, what's the point of buying if all you're using the buy-in on is nothing? Or nothing of importance. The second question that you always ask is, maybe in some cases it is not such a bad idea that conservatives or conservative men aren't influenced in your decision making. Because the moment you start letting these conservatives be factored into consideration of your decision making calculus, that's when you've lost any ability to come up with future controversial policies. That means that you'll never be able to live in a system. You always want to struggle with these structures that capture them in the status quo, rendering them unable to speak, silence and deprive of the right to alter their political situations. So, it's a long term perhaps, right? So, what's the point? Long term. So, not, not just what's the point now, what's the point in the long run now? Another way of looking at it is like, do you really need that much support in buying the to through agenda and policy? So, look at America. Like, America passed through, uh, in the Supreme Court, that is, universal uh, passing or legalization of same sex marriage. Yet, America is still very divided. The move itself is not getting like kumbaya popular reception across America. It is clearly a place where there is division and there is English. But just because it is big less doesn't A mean that it is therefore ineffective or not possible for you to get change, because often you only need to reach a critical threshold. So the way you imagine this is that, you know, you're pouring water. This is it. So, this is a tap. This is water. Like, you don't need the water to come to, like, here and overflow in order for this beaker to have water. You know why? Because all you need is enough water to reach this, and you'll start getting water here. Right? Does that make sense? What it therefore means is you don't need everyone to like you, you just need enough people to You just need enough people to get to the legislative seat. Enough people to get voice and agenda sense. Enough people to get a sort of self-sustaining moral economy to use the language of Jonathan Haidt, who I hate, but he's nevertheless decent, but he's really useless. Anyway, this guy wrote like some stupid books that I think you might want to check out when, when, he, when he writes about it. Uh, he, Jonathan Haidt wrote this like hot take about the idea that we all live in a very moral economy, that we live in a sociological condition where our communities reward us if we exhibit certain moral behaviours and punish us if we exhibit certain immoral behaviours that deviate from the community norm. In other words, virtue signaling gets you social capital, not virtue signaling gets you no social capital. <coughs> virtue signaling is also what Tom Marines like to do, yes. When does the movement will start to Make, uh, to make trade-offs in order to obtain more popularity. Because if I imagine how social movements begin and develop, their popularity is based on their community. Excellent! That's the final point. 
purity influence and popularity amongst key demographics. Why do I say that? Well, if you're a feminist movement and you say, I like men's rights, particularly to the men, do you think women who struggle from abuse from men would still come to you? Or alternatively, in a movement about LGBT rights, you start saying, ah, oh, straight people are superior to gay people, just to get buy in from straight people. Do you think gay people would go to that movement? No. The extent to which people are willing to engage in the movement is determined by the extent to which they feel affiliated with and associated with the movement. If anyone goes out there and says, I hate your sexuality, it won't go to it. That is why buy-in decreases when there's a lot loss of purity, because then you lose your core constituents. Or alternatively, in very liberal societies, you get a bunch of like people saying the following things. It, in a liberal, liberal, liberal society, you've learned your social movements are liberal. Like, you have occupied Democrats, have LGBTQ pro ministry, I don't know, and like you have 10,000 LGBTQ organizations. In the left wing circles, or indeed in the far right circles and the right wing circles, these movements might also compete in terms of the popularity on a basis of purity. So purity becomes a decisive factor to shape whether or not they get more money and support. So an illustrative case of this is like Bernie Sanders versus comparatively progressive but not quite progressive individuals in the current US presidential race. So you might say, well, look, there's Bernie Sanders, and then there's Warren, and there's like Pete Buttigieg, and then there's also like, what's oh, really, ah, that's, yeah, she's really boring, I've forgotten her name, Kildebrand, no, Kildebrand, Kildebrand, whatever. But there are loads of progressive people, but the reason why they get, aren't getting that much traction or popularity with Bernie is because Bernie is seen as more pure than any of these other individuals. So you can actually flip the buy-in argument on the tent and say, no, 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 it is not purity versus popularity, purity leads to popularity. So these are all the ways that you use to break that down. I'm not giving you the argument here, I'm giving you ways to weigh it out and think about smart responses here. So these are the things you can say to deal with challenges about the loss of popularity. Now let's jump to the other side. Say you defend popularity against purity. How can you do this smartly? Well, one way of saying this is to say, having some actual change that really matters is still better than no change, even though you cost for a lot. So this is where you go out there and say, I find it ridiculous that the other side supports posturing in, in the absence of actual progress for the constituents they want to represent. Why do I say this? Well, maybe the most some along the lines of, you know, this house believes that women in conservative society should not endorse or adopt the claim that sex is a social construct. And Prop goes up and says, well, you know, this is really important because sex is a social construct as a narrative alienates a lot of people, including most people that don't understand postmodernist nonsense. And Locke says, ah, but sex is a social construct. You're being oppressive here when you don't say sex is a social construct. And then, if you're all standing for popularity, all you need to do is say, look, I recognize that in you know, your nice liberal art colleges in the USA, this is what you talk about in a classroom. But this is not what women who are suffering from literal abuses, literal exclusion from work, literal violence, or psychological aggression when they walk in the streets care about. They don't care if sex is a social construct. They care about safety. And we give them that safety. So it is the idea that we give them guaranteed and certain benefits rather than fluffy, wishy-washy, almost bollocks benefits that Bob is talking about there. So that's one way of paraphrasing Bob, that you get certain guaranteed benefits, maybe not an ideal world, but you still few steps ahead of the other side in reaching and approximating that ideal, in a sense. That's one way of replying to the popularity of the, the purity thing. The second thing is to note is that popularity evolves. So, suppose you're currently being converted into a um, pro-Chinese rights, Chinese and Eastern Europe rights movement. And you're like, I've never heard of the Chinese and Eastern Europe, what rights are there? And someone comes up to you and says, Actually, if you care about this movement, that just means that you think everyone should be equal. You're like, oh, okay, I'm on board with that. And then you step after that and you say, oh, actually, Chinese aren't just Chinese, there are many different types of Chinese. So your friend introduces you to that idea gradually. And then after that, your friend, you're like, now, think about it. If you're a Han Chinese, or if you're a minority Chinese living in Eastern Europe, you might feel blah, 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 that's pretty bad. What do you think about that? And you're like, this is pretty bad. I'll protest it. And then finally, you get roped into the movement. Compare this against the discursive violence against or perpetrated against the Chinese diaspora in Eastern Europe. 
is indicative of the postmodernist, post-structuralist, de- deconstructionist issues of capitalism intersecting with white supremacism. You're like, I don't know what you're talking about. Good night, goodbye. Don't talk to you. Purity is off-putting. Popularity is welcoming. And popularity is self-evolving because it allows you to understand or get more information bit by bit. But when you start taking a particular medicine, you can't just literally jump straight into taking like 10 pills a day, right? You have to move gradually into taking them. Like, I'm not talking about drugs, I'm talking about... Wait, medicine, don't drugs. No, I'm talking about like, medical usage of drugs, right? So hope that's okay. <coughs> we still can't jump straight into like overdosing. We have to acclimatize it, it settle bit by bit gradually into it. And the way you ease into it is through popularity. The way feminism is made popular, it's made more accessible to a lot of men who might be, I don't want to talk about postmodernist nonsense that you're talking about yet, but might be open to, don't be a dick, be nice. And you're like, actually, yeah, I won't be a dick, I'll be nice to, to people. And then you move gradually into feminism. So popularity is a gateway, whereas purity politics is opposing because it is A, inaccessible, B, associated with very negative connotations, and C, simply is not emotionally galvanizing or motivating for large ways of course constituents to arrive. Persuade me to join your movement. Are we clear so far? The final thing to note in defense of popularity against purity is the political mechanism. If you're not a very lefty politician, how do you pitch Marxism to this politician? Do you say, well, the false consciousness that you live under the centrist politician is the result of your structural hegemonic privilege and also the way capital has been distinguished and dislocated from you and the disembodiment of you from your labour is a sign of alienation and what Durkheim terms normlessness and no more. Or do you say, actually, centrist politician, do you care about workers you know, living decent conditions, like having a decent life, like not living like shit. Which one is more emphatically powerful to persuade him into the violence? Or rather, if you want to say, actually, I think most workers would want their lives to not be shit. That seems to be far more preferable to someone say, has you read this academic book by Ralph Millivander and Marxism? Obviously, the former is more pure, more theoretical, more extreme. But the latter is what gets political forces, especially those that are not ideologically ingrained in your movement, be open to compromises and taking on your agenda. Yeah. Can actually both forms be in in an equally ma- manner valid as long as you know how, which is the people you are talking to? Good. Well, that I would say is a real life answer. Sadly, in debate land, these CAs, these non teaching adjudicators, like to force us to debate a trade off. So, whilst you're absolutely right, in debate land, you probably be forced to change the take aside. But in real life, of course, you do both. Like, I write, personally, very academic philosophy on historical justice, but I also write very digestible pieces for Hong Kong and Singaporean newspapers in my spare time. I do both at the same time, because you can't be only pure or theoretical, you can't only be. You know, very much popular, like, you know, hashtag historical reparations, or like, YOLO swipe reparations. You have to do both at the same time. But in debate land, you would be asked to prioritize. And sometimes one way of breaking that dead trade, uh, that dead off the trade off is to look at the context in which you're operating. So if a country demands more purity than popularity, so you talk about like very advanced democracies and say the rights of LGBT individuals, you might say, in these cases, most people kind of accept LGBT rights anyway, right? So what really matters is therefore the agenda purity and quality of the agenda you're putting forward. And you might say the context here means that we value agenda purity over popularity. But if you talk about cases where you need popularity to get rid of momentum, then you might say we would value the alternative that is popularity over purity in this sense. Cool. So we've done that. We're very efficient with time. Don't copy me in terms of time management and really bad it. Right. Next. Extremism versus centrism. So, not gonna lie. As a Hillary Clinton fan in 2016, as a Joe Biden fan in 2020, I'm a minority in debate. Anyway, cool. So extremism and centrism does not refer to what you use or the techniques or the things that you employ. That's actually radical versus moderation. Instead, extremism versus centrism is a matter of positionality. So this also kind of falls back to what I said about purity versus popularity, right? Where you can imagine effectively 
extreme centrist. And then radicalism and moderation. Actually, no, but this is a radical socialism. This is a very bad diagram. Right wrong, this is a very bad diagram. Okay, cool. So, imagine the following. You have one position, we call this P, and this position, not P. <laughs> this is extreme. This is moderate. Now, this dimension refers to your position. So, if you're extreme, you're here or here. So you're ideologically extreme. So for instance, if P is Marxism, you're like, I want the end of capitalism, and here is, I want to privatize everything, including roads and your health and your body. So that is effectively the two ideological extremes. And the, the, one of the questions we ask in social movements is, to what extent should you make sure that your polls are here or here? Chances are, reality often floats in this range. Because reality is disappointingly centrist. And you're always in the middle. Unless you're, uh, unless you're in like Colombia, or like Venezuela, or like China, or like France, or like Sweden, <laughs> or like Scandinavia, Ukraine. Oh, because, but there's also I love Ukraine, you know, I want to Ukraine. I want to go to a friend. So I want to go to a friend uh, who's Russian and said, what are your thoughts on Ukraine? And he said, oh, a, a province? I said, no, 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 the country. Well, like, oh, no, no, no. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> I just met the Russian extremist, not so good. Anyway, so, that is a question that a lot of folks often ask, which is, to what extent you position here? Or do you keep yourselves within this window? What are the downsides and upsides of both? If you're in the centre, you're far more likely to get mainstream airtime and platform because most of the media, and like, well, maybe not in America, but most of the media tend to group with us towards the middle, or even if they have an ideological position, they won't go like far right, like, they're not super right party, like, they're not super, I don't know, uh, RT. So there's always tendency of more media capture and airtime if you're in the middle. That's one school talk. Now the rebuttal to that, or the objection to that, is say no. Centrism doesn't excite people. Jordan Peterson gets people to watch him, not like some modern conservative. Or like, ZJ gets people to watch him, not some very random left-wing bloke from Oxford or Cambridge. So the rebuttal to that is to say extremism gets you there too. So see, see what I'm doing here? I'm pointing out in debate land, you can use the argument to your advantage. If you're on one side that plans to extremism, you might say it gets you more airtime because it is attention grabbing. On the other hand, you might say, well, actually, you want centrism to be on the other side. You want centrism as opposed to extremism because, in many ways, that's the only way to get you heard by the other side's platforms, other side's media as well. So, the important thing to note here is that is one sort of constant tussle ideologically between pure, uh, not purism, extremism and centrism. Another question we ask under this, though, another factor to consider is Recognize that social movements don't exist in isolation. And this is a very useful argument because, uh, let, let's think of it this way. The analogy is you're a teacher and you're teaching a class of students. This class of students is really naughty. So, that, so one of them is like smoking in class, another one of them is beating another classmate up, and then one of them, another one of them is murdering someone in the background. And then still someone is like chewing gum in front and like throwing a gum at you. If you're a teacher, you would immediately find a gun chewer who is normally unacceptable in any other circumstance. A lovely chap, because relative to everyone else in the classroom, he's by far, or they're by far, the kindest and most gentle person in the classroom. Why is this relevant? Because when you're a political establishment act of dealing with multiple social movements, some of them can be more violent and extreme than others, some of them can just be more ideologically extreme than others, then the relatively central and moderate version of that becomes more palatable, right? So for instance, Malcolm X was more violent and more aggressive and also more radically for redistribution than MLK and Martin Luther King, which is why Martin Luther King was seen as the favourite choice by the establishment to talk to, and they seem as more likely and realistic to reach compromises with, as opposed to Malcolm X. But the miracle here, and the beauty here, is in absence, Martin Luther King without Malcolm X might seem like an extremist as well. But because of the existence of someone on the extremity here, that makes people here, people here, and people here seem more palatable. It is what we call the anchoring effect in psychology, or the relativization effect 
in psychology. How do you rebut this? Well, just think about how Bernie is being attacked right now. And you grant him a bit. Wait, please tell me I'm a racist. Oh no! Oh no! Oh wait, please. In the grand scheme of things, this is left, this is right, Bernie Sanders is here. He's here, he's not a socialist. He, and what people call him communist, he's communist, oh, he's dangerous. He calls himself socialist. Exactly, it does not remind you of the liberals that call themselves liberals but don't really care about other parts of anyone apart from like white men anyway. Great, um, cool. So, Sanders is here. But the presence of a large swathe of communists or like historical understanding of communism means that he's smeared by association. So the rebuttal to what I say about the relative effect is you can also say, get the argument, the existence of extremists tarnished by association, centrist or more moderate counterparts as well. So the implication point here would be what's a good example? Anyone think of an example? Maybe in local elections or national elections. Um, the Socialist Party is basically done with, since we associate them with the communists. And they, they, they. So the association of socialism in parts of Eastern Europe with the, uh, the Warsaw Pact, or as I like to call it without the euphemism, USSR or Soviet Union, has caused people to drag similarities, draw similarities between the extremes of the Gulags and the communism with socialism. But quite, you know, generally not very pro gulags but unfortunately you seen as being pro gulags and gulags so, so that was bad. Anyway, <laughs> no, no, sorry, that was not funny, sorry. But the, the gist here is you can always be tainted by association. So it's not necessarily always the case that you can have extremists clarifying and making the sense of the So what I'm doing here is I'm showing you both sides of the argument. So you're on one side you use one side of the argument, and the other side you use the flip side. So that is the debate about extremism versus centrism. Recognize that this is not about tactics, this is about positions, right? So AOC, uh, Alexandria Castle Cortez, caused radical redistribution, but she's not very radical. She's not like, oh, I'm bomb the bloody capital building just to get like <laughs> AOC liberalism. Like the most radical thing she's done is dance from her office to like the bloody chamber where she debated the policy. So that's not very radical. There's certainly quite extremist to some degree in her ideological set, but it's not radical to the tactic, that technique or repertoire being displayed by. Now you might ask, what's the difference between extremism, centrism versus radicalism and moralism? Well, I think an analogy here is to think of yourself as being in a classroom and you're, you're closet libertarian, so you believe in it through economic freedom. And uh, you're a libertarian, and you're very libertarian, so you think, as you should, that there should be no government, or at least a very small government, and you should have taxes, which is on my view. You should have taxes. But you're very quiet about it. You're like, sir, we don't have taxes today. You're like, sir, we, uh, we uh, have like no government today. And, this, and the teacher goes like, well, no. no. <laughs> In contrast, there's someone who's like very moderate, who's like, mm, I believe in some taxes, but not too much. I believe in some government, but not too much. I believe in a welfare state, but not too much welfare. I believe in a general state economy, a uh, state market economy. See, in the middle. But they're very loud. So they spend the entire class time shouting at the teacher, you know, like, I believe in the importance of some taxation. <laughs> I believe in the importance of some market freedoms. Rawr! And if you don't listen to me, I'll throw a pen at you. Here's the comparison, here's the analogy. Right? In that, the latter is very centrist, but very radical. He's vocal, all about setting the established status quo, throwing rocks at a teacher if necessary. Whereas the latter is very moderate, but extreme. And that is the contrast between radicalism and centrism versus moderatism, sorry, radicalism and moderatism, and centrism versus extremism. One concerns your manifestation and form, the other one concerns your substance. It is not the same thing. So when people say you're like, Alexandra Castro Cortez is like, I don't know, a radical Marxist, you're like, yeah, she might be an extreme socialist, but that doesn't make her a radical Marxist once to overthrow the bloody system. 
It's worth noting that radicalism in Singapore, that you might adopt things like violence. You might adopt things like civil disobedience, like disobeying laws in order to show how wrong it is. It might involve you doing things like extreme legislative action, like filibustering. But it might involve you challenging the state. Sorry for my handwriting, as I as my life needs to participate in social media. Anyway, great. So challenging the state. Now, what are the perks of that? The perks of that is you might say it gets more attention, but these are the other reasons why it's good. A, it applies pressure on particular actors, actors who don't want to be dragged into a radical strike storm, or who feel the pressure of being held accountable for the failure to govern effectively when radicalism breaks out of society. The, so pressure is another mechanism as to why you might say radicalism is uniquely better than moderatism. Because that child sat in the corner, looking like the teacher saying, well, I want another term, thank you, is not going to be as hurt or as pressurizing as someone coming up to me right now and saying, Ryan Moore, why are you doing such a bad lecture? Please sit down and shut up. Right? There's a massive contrast there in the extent to which you've confronted as a power actor and power broker by social movements. And the more, in many ways, it's more radical, it's the more likely it is that they apply pressure directly on the government and, and the actor. But, here's the catch, and here's how you can rebut this argument. Have you ever tried going up to your really angry mother and say, I will defy you? And what was the consequence? It was not, oh son, I will listen to you. <laughs> but more like, shut that up and go into your bloody room. Because it's radicalism against your parents, radicalism against your lecturers, radicalism against your politicians might lead to more violence, suppression, and backlash. Especially in China, where it's not you live in China, it's China lives in you. Well, when you go to the Chinese government and say, I protest you, they'll just reply by saying, I'll protest you too, in prison, goodbye. <laughs> You're locked up. So it is true that radicalism works, but only if the act you're talking about responds to pressure. So the act you're talking about responds to pressure in a negative way, then the opposition of others will say that the actor will react, sure. But no one's there to dispute that nuclear reactors don't react. They react, they boom, they explode. So yeah, and then they do react with bad reaction. So this is how the exchange goes in social movements to make. One side says you apply pressure, the other side says, yeah, but that leads to bad outcomes. See? Yeah. Well, that's because contemporary media constantly portrays LGBTQ based on the images of, the, of, the, of some extreme people mm -hmm. on the parade. And I, even if I know the fact of the idea of anchoring the fact of, and how it actually works in and so forth, I can't, I can't actually make someone, as someone, come, I can actually convince someone the fact that, oh, you, the, they are more bothering than you. Yes. That is exactly what I was going to say. Which is, moral high ground. Some defenders of moderatism would say you want the moral high ground because you say I'm peaceful. I'm not being violent. I'm obeying the law. I'm not taking photographs like I'm not supposed to. They are. <coughs> like, these are all reasons why fundamentally you reckon that the more moderate you are, the more likely it is that they think you're not deviant or undermining the social order in the market. So that's one argument as to why you want to be moderate. How do you rebut that argument? Well, you let your opponents uh, use strategies that do not provide a more high ground that they can get the advantage of you. For example, if you get Obama when he refused to appoint the chief justice, and uh, even though he had the power to, because he was a moral high ground, but then the Republicans came and... Good. So the rebuttal of that is that moral high ground sometimes doesn't matter as much when they always are going to see you as immoral anyway. Because you're kidding babies, or because you're like, pro queer right, so that's immoral, right? So the idea here is that moral high ground only matters when you action in concern. The well, question here is the one that changes the pivot of the speech. We're not going to see you as moral anymore. Like, think about it, right? If a very naughty child in his class suddenly stops swearing one day for like five minutes, you're not going to say, oh, you've got a moral right now. You're just going to be like, oh, got a mouth sore today? Can't swear very well? Too bad? You know? So the claim here is to know that, like, moderation is useful, but not when it already, already see you and would always see you as a radical or to so called undermine of social order. So this is what I mean by the clash between radical versus centrism, okay? And now before we smile at any questions, before we smile at the photo. No? Okay, no smiling. Angry no, faces. No, you can say photo. This. No? <laughs> Not me. 
I'll see if you do this if you want to know more. Any questions? How are you? How am I? Yeah. I am... Um, I'm uh, old. I'm yeah. very old, yes. Old. Can you guess? Very I'm pleased to. <laughs> <laughs> You're still very old. <laughs> I'm 25. 21. Yeah. I'm 21, yes. Damn. Well, I got to turn 21 recently, actually. I used to be 20. <laughs> but anyway. When is your birthday? Halloween. Oh. So, finally, money. Now, money makes the world go down if you've heard the song that you haven't. It's fine. Like, I have a question. Uh, just, uh, An answer. Okay. Yeah, go on. Uh, the question is how do social movements that are radical and hundred on the same specter or that want the same things uh, work with each other or fight together? In short, they don't. That's the thing with radical, they don't understand how to work. But it's fine. I mean, the, the reality is it's very. So they work in a way that's not coordinated. But it's often, it works out in grand scheme things. I think going back to the Malcolm X, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King analogy. Malcolm X and Martin Luther King never sat down and had this, you know, civil rights HQ meeting or something. But what did happen effectively was Malcolm X did a lot of the pressure on uh, media and small firms within particular states through the violence and protests. But also he, he operated in resistance to white supremacist criminal organizations by organizing basically the black power movement. Employed force, they employed violence. So there's a lot of sort of uh, street fighting, this is how mafia worked kind of stuff that was going on in Malcolm X. Whereas in contrast, Martin Luther King didn't really do that sort of stuff. He had some sit in, some quasi like forceful defiance moments, but it's actually more peaceful. And you can say this is a division of labor, because again, going back to the example of AIDS, um, I, I erased the time now. The idea of relativization, it worked out in the grand scheme of things without coordination because one of them made the other look good, but without that particular party in the Malcolm X, there would never have been enough momentum to force all of those silent actors that eventually did come to the fore of at least begrudgingly granting civil rights to African Americans. Without Malcolm X, that would never have happened. They claim here is they, they didn't work together like sit in the HQ and had a nice phone call, but it certainly worked in a grand scheme, organic way, in that sense. And this is an analogy you can draw to many other uh, social movements. So Zadio and Zaku, in South Africa, can you read this? No? Okay, it's fine. Or, to uh, Leon Yanavest, what? Gilles de Jean, uh, <laughs> The Yellow Vest movement and the sort of left wing movement <coughs> within France. You know, in my opinion, I think Macron is left wing, but then no one agrees with me. It's okay, I'm wrong. I agree. Good, good. good. Macron's too left wing. You know, there are people who say that he isn't left wing. Huh? What? Everyone? <laughs> he is, yeah, he is generally seen as a neoliberal figure, which in my opinion tries to sound economic. So anyway. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, finally, on money, which is something I really like talking about, is money and food. So, to what extent should social movements have money? Who thinks they should have money? If you're a leading movement, do you want money for the movement? Of course. Of course. Yeah. Right, why do you want money? That's brainstorm reasons. To do things. Oh. That is a very specific answer. Any more? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Good one. Um, you, can, you can organize protests, um, you can distribute posters uh, and some kind of uh, materials that are promoting your movement. Um, Good. Um, yeah. Keep on understanding. We're brainstorming, yes? Uh, information campaigns that are uh, in the internet, for example, mm -hmm. or you can employ people to work for you, you can, you know, uh, in the social movements. If you want to function in the right way, in the you know most efficient way, you need people that work all the time on you know things that, such as education or recruitment and so on, and you have to pay them because they cannot be hey, ideas. Good. What else? Uh, well, media to attract media. Good. Social media, media, good. Conferences, like all those. That's part of attention grabbing. Like, what else? Uh, lobbying, like yeah. Good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, oh, wait, maybe. Well, with arguments like you, sorry, to uh, 
enter into this discussion. Great. Anything else? Setting up schools, resource distribution centers, aid centers, community centers. See, money is really important. And these are the ways that you can explain why money matters. Yeah. Depending on what kind of social movement it is, it might want to have some kind of victims of uh, domestic violence or mm -hmm. so on, you know, the, of the oppression that they're going to get. Good. Support. Excellent. So these are all reasons why money matters. And you should be able to talk about these reasons off the top of your head. Covered seven reasons why. Very easy. No need for 13 reasons why, just seven. Except 13 reasons why is a bit much too excessive in many ways. <laughs> Right, cool. Why might money be bad? If you take your money from corporations, why is that bad? Uh, because people don't like it when you take money. Okay, so you lose five percent. Because capitalism is bad. I find it very hard to intuitively accept that. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> yes? Corporations can use the money to influence you. Good, and. Yeah, you, know. well, you can't really judge them if you don't take money from them. For example, there are a lot of corporations that oppress a certain group of people. Correct. But when they look good in, in the state, the social state, you kind of cannot judge them or avoid the problem. Good. Very obvious. Science, question, and dissent. Yeah. Uh, in the end, you want to follow us, you're seen as impure if you try Good. to follow a thing. Which loses you buy-in and also loses you engagement in the critical community. Good? Yes? Well, probably if you, if you become more weak, the, the movement itself becomes, becomes more corporate and uh, lose connection with its personal connection with its people. Good. So there are probably three reasons why corporatization is rejected. One, loss in buy-in from important demographics and constituents and groups. Two, uh, dilution of message because corporations like to do things like, have you seen a Pepsi advert with like Kylie Jenner and Black Lives Matter? Yeah. So Pepsi decided that would be a great idea to get an advert with Kylie Jenner, a kid you not grabbing a can of coke, going up to a bunch of African American protesters, cracking it open, and then giving it to the police minister saying, drink and all is well. Why didn't they shoot her? That's always what I'm wondering. Yeah, I mean, I would. Does the American way? I always had that question given that she was drinking Pepsi. <laughs> That's why you shoot some Pepsi. Why would you drink Pepsi? Like, if you want Pepsi, you shoot Coke. If you don't want Coke, you've got to drink Red Bull. You don't like that, you drink like what? Luke can say, why would you drink Pepsi? Sorry. Continue. So, you might say there's a dilution. And the final thing there is that it silences dissent and critical challenges to particular groups. So there are three parts of this argument. Part one, why do corporations have incentives that? Simple. PR, profit focus, just by the shareholders. Part two, what does that mean? Can't call out corporate excesses in these corporations. Two, can't call out corporate excesses in all corporations. And three, can't call out the oppressive nature of capitalism and causing things like deflation of wages, instability and precariousness, precariousness of labor, and also pressure of workers by dissolving unions and the thatch right and regular government. Part three, why does it mean that when you don't have the money from these corporations, you can do that better? Simple, because now you can focus only on pushing out Marxist critiques of the, uh, the uh, hyper-patriarchal, capitalistic, discursive, oligocentric state. That is obviously an impressive construct in that state. So this is how you run the debate about whether money is good. These are the four main issues that you'll see in debates about social movements. You learn the ways that these arguments and ideas that talk about just and work. You can do very well on all of them at various to beat most other teams have got in general a lot of good teams in these rounds. So these are the broad the essence of the debates that I think it's important for you to note. Now, for the last 10 or 12 minutes, what are we going to do? We're going to um, have something, we're going to be more interactive like social movements are with a government. So, let's imitate social movements. I have a question for that. I have an answer. Yeah. Uh, when a social movement changes, how does one extreme or radical or, you know, centrist radical or whatever movement uh, rebrand itself as more moderate and so on? Because, uh, you know, times change, people uh, and some social movements, and especially in the base, uh, many debates are, you know, this social movement will change the way it, you know, uh, attacks a certain problem. How does one social movement rebrand itself as less radical or more extreme or so? In practice, it often just comes down to very small, you know, micro-level action. So, of course, you have the top-down branding thing, the higher-up the like, instead of having, you know, 
I am for workers' rights too. I am for workers' paradise. <laughs> Boom! Quick maths! <laughs> like, you know, living in a workers' paradise like the song. No, you don't know the song, but you don't know the song. Never mind. That's why. But it, 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 in practice, what it really is often is just really the same and doing things are very different. So you, sometimes it's a drastic process. <coughs> it might just be one day you change your mind and you're like, boom! I think I'm in favour of trans rights, but it, more often than not, it's a series of gradual changes. It's a transformation where you go like, well, if you were transphobic first, you can start by saying, actually I'm not going to talk that much about trans people. And then you say, actually, maybe trans people do have rights. Actually, maybe it is a part of our feminist ideology that we should have, you know, care for trans people's rights. And finally, you become non-transphobic. It's gradual, right? It's kind of like, if you're on rehab from, like, drugs, you don't just cut off, well actually I've no lived experience, so I might just be making this up, but I presume you can't just cut it off straight away, right? You have to like transition, like nicotine. Like if you're smoking, you then transition to nicotine pads, and then nicotine pads are nothing. It's a gradual process, it's like growing up, you know? Like rehab and growing up are actually very similar. Both of them involve waiting and often not with very good consequences. But anyway, like, don't quote me on that. Right? The gist here is it is a gradual process because we have to sound the public process genuine and plausible. If Joe Biden goes up and says, I've got Marxism tomorrow, you'd be like, what on earth are you on? Are you on like, you know, bloody, uh, uh, like H or you're on K or like C? I don't know what you're on, but you're definitely not on, like, you know, not online right now. Okay, so that, that's the gist of the observation. In order to preserve authenticity and perceived by the credibility, even if it's going rapidly political, so, a final few. Wow, time flies like airplanes that don't crash. So, for the nine minutes, I would like to talk about examples of movements you should know. The first example is the yellow. First. No. Yellow umbrella movement. Ha! Ah! Caught you there. <laughs> It is a movement that was in Hong Kong in 2014. It was basically a symbol of resistance against China where people flooded the streets of the central business district and uh, stayed there for 79 days. Isn't it just a brown movement? I'm trying to trick you, so let me do that. It is yellow and brown movement. No, fine, it is a brown movement. So there were yellow umbrellas used to shield the protesters from tear gas, and that was where the name came from. What is interesting about this is this is a classic case of a historically very politically apathetic group of people in the Hong Kong population, don't talk about politics, suddenly becoming incredibly, incredibly activated after the 928 incident when the police fired tear gas at a protest. And uh, you might not think tear gas means that much in general, but in Hong Kong it's a really big deal. Tear gas was only deployed previously, 20 years ago, before this particular protest, against like a bunch of foreign Korean farmers. So, that means that we don't often see tear gas being used, if at all, in Hong Kong, and the deployment of that is a really, really big deal. That led to substantial backlash against the government. That led to a lot of people, politically academic or young people, or even moderate people that used to back the government, to change their minds. Because they're like, why on earth are we allowing the government to fire tear gas? And that was very good. Yeah. Did this movement start because of the China's uh, policy of uniting Hong, Hong Kong from the mainland? I mean, I know that in 2049 this will happen, but I also know China started doing so gradually. Well, basically the immediate, you're right, but the immediate trigger for this China issue that doctrine had said Hong Kong would not have universal suffrage. They're like, we will not allow you to have elections. God forbid you elect your own people that you actually like. Mm. Oh, my dear. Boom! And then we're like, no, screw you, China. Went straight into like what we call in Chinese or Hong Kong sense war. Because yeah, Hong Kong would be love peace. So the most violent would ever get is just sit on the streets. That's Hong Kong to you. Bougie capitalist mindset. Petty bourgeoisie. Anyway, no, I mean they're great, they're great. I'm petty bourgeoisie. The second movement you should know is Can anyone read the handwriting here? Great! It is started by Greta Thunberg, the, uh, the boycott of classes. 
But also in London right now, they have a movement of a bunch of people sat on like roads and streets and can't really see, protest, protesting something that most people also can't really see, i.e. climate change. So, it is worth noting that this is a movement that is directed towards a transnational and international court. And whilst this hasn't historically been like that rare in that the 1990s it was a local protest at the end of WTO, in 2000 there were protests at the end of the Nationals in Market CF Occupy Wall Street, what is unique about this is that this is a protest against, I guess, a natural slash quasi-environmental problem that is induced by human action. Right? So I, I presume most of you, not all of you, hopefully the lead as a centric and the genetic climate change are the real thing. That this is a protest against what they perceive to be governmental inaction. What is so unique about this is not necessarily what it's forced the local government to do, because frankly speaking, Theresa May, no, sorry, the British government, former and previously led by Theresa May 24 hours ago, and no longer led by Theresa May, really didn't give a toss about climate change. Like, they were like, oh yes, there are certainly deliberate consequences of climate change, thank you very much for your addition. It was not the local domestic changes that mattered. It was a symbolic and aesthetic and optical salience and attention and attraction that gave internationally that has made that movement work, right? And the reality is the local government in London is just like, oh, crumbles. My cupcakes and my afternoon tea set my cup must wait for me because there's a bit of traffic in Hyde Park. Apparently, and that's not so cool. Enough. Whereas, in practice, what it's actually done is it's provided a galvanizing and rallying symbol of what it means to have this climate change crisis, who it is that is taking on this crisis, and it's given a movement a human face, right? And greater, so sorry, it's really fighting for the greater cause. That was a joke, you can laugh, no? <laughs> She's making climate change activism greater again. We all love climate change in the bit, though. Good! So that even teaches you critical thinking. You just proved how critical I can be of your thinking. You got that a good one. Like, hey, all of my jokes are good. I like climate change measures. So, the gist here is this is a second to the like, example you should know. The final example you should know, to sound smart, is Thailand, where the red shirts and the yellow shirts were effectively used by the army and also the privileged uh, capitalists as ways to, to well, one of them, one group of them was backed by the army, the other group of them was backed by the populists and the small businesses and farmers in the south of Thailand. I think this is a very good example of where political actors use social movements, so it's not social movements used political actors, it's like a meme where it's not you need this country, the country needs you. The social movement is used by political actors to stir up the momentum and political sort of uh, the political momentum and pressure to, to, to achieve things like regime change. Where because of the clash of the Greens movement, there were loads of regime transfers and changes in between 2008 and 2013 in Thailand, between two competing factions, where each faction would operate for a while until enough of those people on the other side rocked up to protest and paralyzed those and were like, oh, I give up, or like the army would step in and take over in response, or so they claim, to these protesters flooding the streets. It's worth noting that in the case of Thailand, a lot of this is instigated by politicians and political actors, not in a down, like, bottom-up approach, or bottom-up sense, but from a top-down approach that is imposed from political actors with vested interests associated with these movements and behaviors. So I think that's the third example you should know and cite. Note that a lot of them, apart from the climate change, are quite Asian. The reason why I'm doing that is because you can introduce a larger variety geographically, and because diversity matters, not just in a sense of gender, sexuality, sexual orientation, debating ability, or whatever, but also in geography. And we don't have geographical diversity in common America. And you don't want to be common American because that's a horrible, horrible lifestyle. The only So, does that make sense? Great. Well, thank you very much. And are you guys going to stay here? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not going to stay here because I need to run down to the. Uh... Oh, I need to go back to the meaningful. Oh no. I hate my life. No problem. <laughs>
very time to say something.